views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello and welcome to Open, the show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Jaime, and today we're going to update you on what's happening in and around our borough. Coming up on today's show, we'll bring you the latest in the world of politics. Then, if you find yourself looking to apply for public housing, today we're going to talk about some much-needed resources that are available in your area. Then a little later on in the show, we're going to take you to an event that pretends to prepare and empower young women for the workforce right here in our borough aimed at helping them to reach their full potential. Then, for those who love running and activities outdoors, well, we're going to discuss the Van Cortland Track Club One Mile Flat that will be held on Global Running Day. That's coming up later on in the show. And then we're going to introduce you to a filmmaker and a Bronx designer, the best of arts and in our borough that you can't miss. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially open. And hello, everyone. I'm your host, Darren Jaime, and today is Wednesday, May 30th, and you're watching Open. Live program bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV set. Now, we want to encourage you to stay connected to us. How do you do that? Well, you can find out more about us on Twitter at BronxNetTV and Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. Well, a lot has certainly been going on over this past week. We get busy right now with our Bronx updates. Kingsbridge Heights teenager is now in custody, charged with the murder of an Inwood man last month. Jeremiah N. Melendez was captured by authorities and is charged with second-degree murder in the killing of Ronnie Gardner, a 28-year-old Inwood man last month. Gardner was fatally stabbed on Sedwick Avenue, and police were able to make the arrest due to video surveillance footage. Police also identified four men that they wanted to question in the case. They're looking for one with dark, curly hair, one that's also wearing a blue do-rag as well as dark clothing, and another with low-cut black hair, last seen wearing a red and black sweatshirt, gray pants, and black sneakers. And one man wearing a gray hooded sweatshirt, blue jeans, and black sneakers. Now, if you've seen any of these people or anyone, police are asking if you have any information as well. You're asked to call the New York City Department's Crime Stoppers hotline. Their number is 1-800-577-8477. Tips also can be submitted by logging on to the Crime Stoppers website at nypdcrimestoppers.com. Well, NYCHA announced a new program aimed at providing cheaper, clean energy to low- and moderate-income residents. Now, the program would feature installing solar panels that could generate up to 25 megawatts of renewable energy by 2025. Now, that's the largest goal for a multifamily housing owner in the United States, NYCHA official state, but neighbors have different concerns. They're far more concerned with more pressing quality of life problems like mold, mildew, rodents, windows, and leakage. We'll continue to update you on NYCHA's progress. Also talking to City News, the New York City Parks Department Partnerships for Parks, along with students from PS279 and local leaders, officially broke ground on a project. The Walton Park is one of 17 parks in the borough, listed for renovation as part of the Community Parks Initiative. New features will include a new playground sprinkler system as well as ADA accessible entrances. The park could be completed as early as the end of 2018. Well, in other news, the pearly gates in Westchester Square will be adding some additional LED lighting at the intersections of Trapman Avenue and St. Peter's Avenue as well as Trapman and Roland Avenues. In the past, parks were subject to large amounts of vandalism while dangerous gang activity had also tarnished the pearly gates as well. Well, now that more lights will be installed, 
The park is deemed to be more safer to be around, and the, Luna, and the new lights, I should say, should be installed by the end of June in the second quarter of the year. Well, lastly, the ferry at Class and Point and Soundview is expected to become operational sometime this summer. But news that the city's executive budget allocated $300 million over the next several years for ferry infrastructure reinforcement and expansion will not lead to additional docks here in the Bronx. Now, this according to a source at EDC. After the launch of the Soundview ferry, EDC plans to commence a feasibility study in the fall to examine what additional communities New York City Ferry can expand to in the future. Paul Klein of the City Island Chamber of Commerce says that the organization has continually advocated for extending ferry service and that Orchard Beach would be a good location because it has several thousand car parking lots that's underutilized throughout most of the year. Of course, we'll keep you updated on all of these stories. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to have more open coming up right after this. neighbors and best friends. <laughs> I love my sister. My heart, my heart doesn't, doesn't see race. race. Love, love is love. Our family is no less than any other family. And we're back. Well, what's happening in the political world? President Trump reigniting racial tensions. U.S.-China trade war is back in the news. And here to tell us more is our political expert, Lee Bynes. Well, and uh, good to have you. Good to be back. Hey, uh, let's start, first talk, uh, before we get into uh, pol politics, this does have political ramifications. Mm -hmm. Roseanne, uh, the actress, has now had her series terminated by ABC. Uh, the reboot, the relaunch was was given. This after racist comments were made via Twitter in regards to Valerie Jow Jarrett, mm -hmm. uh, former Obama executive. Uh, some people have said that, you know, Roseanne is, well, not some people, everybody knows who Roseanne has always been mm -hmm. consistently with racist remarks. But the question that's being put on the table is the presidency and reigniting the passion for people who've had racial undertones now to be very out front with it and Roseanne coming in, no surprise. But you know what, I, I think that Roseanne's remarks and the situation that she's in right now is pretty much emblematic of, uh, of the Trump presidency, of the Trump's campaign, uh, throughout his campaign and throughout his uh, uh, presidency thus far. He's, it's, been a, it's been a lot of racial tension. And uh, I, I think a lot of, uh, uh, of folks in his camp, those who happen to, to support him, uh, have been given a license to, to, uh, to go beyond the pale. And they feel as though that uh, they they now have have a voice, and they can uh, they can express that voice any way that they want to. So when Ro Roseanne made those remarks, um, she was feeding feeding Trump's base. I mean, Trump came out, and the reason why this is uh, is as political as it is entertainment is because tr when she uh, 
her, her show opened uh, a few months ago when the, the, the season just started. He actually placed a call to her and let her know, look, I am so proud of you because, well, firstly, she mentioned that uh, he was, she, she was talking to his base. She represented the people who voted for him. And the people who voted for him are the same uh, individuals that, uh, that are, are part of the, uh, of the, the, who would support this new ban in the, uh, uh, the NFL, cons uh, banning uh, players from taking a knee. Sure, the, uh, the owners have decided that, uh, oh, if you don't want to uh, uh, stand and salute the flag or, or pay attention to the national anthem, you can just stay in the locker room. But uh, that's, that's hardly any answer to what's going on. Yeah, and I want to say that, you know, this isn't the first time that she's uh, talked about somebody in the Obama administration earlier on. Uh, she made some very disparaging comments against Susan Rice. Yes, she likened her to being a monkey as well. And, uh, uh, you know, ABC did the right thing in terms of uh, canceling the show, but I have a feeling that that had more to do with money than it, was, than it had to do with doing the right thing. Um, Roseanne's history was well documented. Uh, if they wanted to do the right thing, they would have they would have never brought her on board in the first place. I think they did it because they knew that uh, a lot of money could be made. And uh, uh, when they found out that she couldn't be toned down, it was too late. She had already kind of just uh, destroyed herself and would have done the same thing with the network as well because a lot of people were already going to pull their, their funding. Advertisers were going to be f fleeing. and. They did the right thing for the bottom line. Let me switch first for a minute and talk about where are the children. I know you've got some concerns about that and some things that you want to bring to the table. Absolutely. And you know what? Uh, this Again, this all plays into the, the, the race thing as well because, you know, there's uh, as, much, as many as 1,500 uh, kids that are missing right now. Uh, I want to I clear up some... some uh, uh, complications on this issue because the, the the Trump administration is trying to say that this was a holdover from Barack Obama's administration but um, I, I did a little research on this and uh, sure when Barack Obama was um, uh, when people were being caught at the border uh, his policy was that they would be uh, detained but they would be detained until their cases individually could be adjudicated. Now, basically what that means is that these people would come before a judge, the judge would take a look at their particular circumstance, determine, give them an opportunity to explain themselves, and uh, uh, share evidence, witness statements that, uh, that would uh, support their case for asylum. That being, if, that, if they made, you know, made it over those, those uh, legal uh, bars, then those people had an opportunity to stay in the United States and their families would be reunited. Now, the only reason why the children in that situation were uh, separated for their, their uh, parents in a temporary situation is because it would be illegal to uh, incarcerate a child indefinitely. And since these cases, we didn't know how long that they would take, that's, that was the reason for that situation. This is different right now because uh, that was a policy of necessity. This is now a, a, the, the, the latest policy that Donald Trump's own uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions came out before the cameras, before uh, reporters, and said that now the new uh, standard is, is that if you cross the border, you have broken the law. If you broke the law, you're going to be prosecuted, and you're going to be incarcerated as a result of that. Now, I did not do uh, enough background. I didn't have a ch enough time to find out how long of a, of a term you would get for breaking that particular law of crossing the border, but the, your ch you would also be subject to having your child taken away from you. Now, when the child is uh, removed from th that person, the, the, the parent's care, custody, and control, and placed in the, in the, uh, the hands of HS HSS, that child is now, they're going to find sponsors, they're going to find homes, they're going to find uh, relatives if they can. But um, uh, they must not have done a very, very good job in vetting the people that these, these children were being placed in the care of simply because they said the HSS in pushback saying that, well, here's the deal. Um, when we called, uh, we found that possibly a lot of these, the people who took charge of these children could have been undocumented people them themselves, and that's the reason why they're not staying in contact. But if that was the case, why were they placed in, that, in those that in the care of those folks in the first place. Mm -hmm. So uh, not only that, um, I, I, I found since this issue blew up that HS, HHS, um, Health and Human Services, has no uh, plans to, to go out and locate these children. As far as they're concerned, as far as border security is concerned, homeland security is concerned, it's out of their hands. So there's no, no way that these people are going to tra track these children down and make sure that they haven't fallen into the hands of... Uh, predators, 
traffickers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a travesty, and this is a, a, going to be a black stain on America's history. Uh, certainly a story that we will continue to follow, and I know that we will continue to update as, as we get more information. Sure. I want to get ready because uh, here in New York, of course, we're getting ready for primary elections, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of people are concerned, saying, listen, uh, the recent activity at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is heightening a base that's actually coming out to be able to vote. Do you think that we're going to see stronger voter turnout, given the fact that in primaries and in these midterm elections, given the height of the United States of America being now dubbed as the divided states of America? Well, you know what? I would normally in a in, in a uh, uh, a midterm election, uh, the the vote is usually a, a lot less because people pretty much want to come out and vote in the presidential election. Mm -hmm. However, um, Donald Trump has been so divisive and so upsetting to so many people throughout the country. I have a feeling that this uh, this uh, is going to be a referendum on him. He's not on the ballot, but people are going to come out to vote against the party in and of itself. And based upon what's happening as far as race relations are concerned, uh, and that in and of itself is an all-time low, uh, based upon the fact that uh, the, the Me Too movement has been, um, the uh, hashtag Me Too movement has been spawned under his presidency, and he is one of the a major offender. I could see a lot of folks coming out to cast a ballot against the GOP just to make a statement. If that's if that's possible, uh, he could lose the House. If he does lose the House, there's an opportunity for impeachment. And I guess the question is, does he maintain his base? I was on a plane just a few just a few minutes ago uh, okay. before co coming in, and there was a lady who said, "Listen, um, I'm a fiscal conservative. I don't like everything he says, but he's my guy. And if he runs again in four years, he's still going to get my vote in spite of all the craziness." And there's some people out there who really say, listen, we're going to put the personal part aside, and they say, fiscally, this is our guy. Well, you know what? There's a lot of people in this country that pretty much looks at the bottom line, their own specifically, uh, and the economy has been doing well. The market has been up and down, up and down, but mostly up. And uh, there's a lot of folks who really don't take moral character as, um, as, as a barometer of, of a good president. They are looking at uh, how well the economy is doing. If there's jobs, and right now we cannot deny it, I, I, reportedly anyway, that the unemployment is down to 3.9 percent. As long as people are working and they can put food on the table, they may overlook a lot of things. However, there is a, a very, very strong uh, 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 portion of the population that uh, do take uh, moral character uh, seriously. They do have principles, and, and they do um, uh, take... Uh, American values uh, to be worth something. So uh, it could be an up and down type of thing. But again, as far as his base is concerned, uh, he's going to have some uh, a lot of folks to stick with him. I was looking at some of the uh, um, uh, comments and some of this, because that's where you really get a feel for how people are thinking when mm -hmm. you read some of these stories. And uh, when the Valerie Jarrett um, comment uh, story came out, uh, Roseanne Barr had a lot of support. And there was not only, there was a lot more, even worse. Uh, comments that were being made about her, Susan Rice, Barack Obama, et cetera, inside that comment section. So there's a lot of people who they like what they see in Donald Trump. And I'm, I'm a little worried that this country may be so divided that we're, we're talking about a 50-50 split. Mm. And, you know, you could call it for what it is, but that's, that may be the case. All right. Lee Bonds, that's why we bring you in every week. That's what I'm here for. All right. Taking a quick break. Listen, we got more shows. Stay with us. Don't go away. We're coming right back right after this. How can I help my daughter with her reading? Searching for help with Dachshund Reading. No. <laughs> Let me try. Sarah's bright, but when she's reading, she has trouble sounding out words. Playing world music. What? I give up. Wait, I was trying to show you how Sarah feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. For all the papas out there, let's stop what we're doing and take a moment. A moment to be with our kids. They can be loud moments, goofy moments, sporty moments. 
dorky moments, kooky moments, moments where we talk or walk or just hang out. It doesn't really matter. They all count because every time dads take a moment to be with their kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's all take a moment to make a moment today. I guess sometimes things just happen. Devastating things. Your whole world changes in an instant. That's what happened to me the day my mother had a stroke. I'm Paul George, and I want you to spot a stroke fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke fast. Well, if you're in need in housing, sometimes the big questions you have to ask are, what are the resources that are available? Well, today we have Anna Melendez with us, and she's the chief program officer at Nos Cadamos. We stay, and good to have you so much. Thank uh, you. Ha have you with us, and uh, so much information that's out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but we want to make sure that our viewers get everything they can get. Uh, and for people who really are trying to get housing, because housing is a big issue, all across New York City, all across the five boroughs. Uh, but you guys have been working hand in hand with trying to get people housed, I should say. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So we've had, um, we've been part of a program with um, New York City Housing, uh, I'm sorry, with HPD, the Housing mm -hmm. Preservation and Development. Um, it's called Ready to Rent. So part of the program is to help apartment seekers prepare to apply for the low income tax credit housing that's available on the New York City Housing Connect website. Um, some of the challenges that we have at Nos Quedamos is the fact that there are so many people in need of housing and there are not that many options available. Mm -hmm. Although you see so many affordable housing developments coming up around the city, um, there are so many barriers to getting the housing. It can be uh, the fact that they might not qualify because of their household income. And there's so many um, things that people are not aware of. And then there's also this um, like as people come through our doors, they're like, I want to apply for housing, and they assume that they can apply for public housing, which is NYCHA, um, and the options that we have at the moment is really applying for the low income tax credit housing. Right. Um, because the NYCHA uh, developments at the moment, they have like uh, a waiting list of over 250,000 people. So, um, 250,000 people waiting to be housed. In NYCHA? In NYCHA. Wow. Yeah, so, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, people coming through the door saying, I've applied for housing and I've been on the waiting list for over 15 years, almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, also for the Section 8 vouchers, which is another option that people may have um, where they can apply for um, a voucher that will help them to qualify for any market rate. And that's a waiting list of over 150,000. So the challenge that we have in our organization, because um, we started this program in January, and we're coming to the end of the funding cycle, mm -hmm. uh, we might not be able to offer the program um, you know, through HPD, but because of our commitment to the community, we're going to continue to do the work. Uh, we've been um, helping folks to apply for the um, to affordable housing through the Housing Connect um, website, mm -hmm. and we we've already generated a waiting list of our own of over 400 people. So those are people who have not even been seen in our organization so wow. we're uh, faced with the challenge of how are we going to see them without many resources as mm -hmm. far as funding um, so you know we're asking the city to sit down with organizations like Nos Quedamos because we're on the ground we know what's, what's, what it's like day, day to day we know what our community need, our community needs and um, you know we just need them to sit down with us and figure out what are the options available mm -hmm. and how can we better um, meet the needs for housing that we have. In have they community. been willing to sit, to come to the table and talk to you about this? Because obviously, as you said, you have 400 people that, that yourself right now that are just on a waiting list. So it's definitely you've mm -hmm. proven the fact that you've, you know, you're, you're really touching a lot of people. Mm -hmm. What's what's been the response? Well, um, we've been working closely with HPD, and I think that the the problem is that um, there are so many city agencies that are offering affordable housing or that are, are working towards affordable housing, but the thing is that if we don't work together, mm -hmm. um, then there, there's no way that we're, we're going to come up with a plan in order to meet the need. So, you know, we need NYCHA at the table, we need HPD at the table, we need DHCR at the table, all of the housing com corporations that are, you know, have the resources, which is like the, the budget, in order to create 
more of the options for um, New Yorkers to, to seek housing. So what can people do, I mean, in this interim right now? I mean, is there is there something we can do in terms of raising awareness, letting people know? Is there anything that can, can help? Well, at the moment, what we've been doing is, um, you know, like just letting people know the different um, barriers to, to them qualifying for housing, just so that they know the difference. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we're all saying everything is affordable housing, um, but the reality is that this is not really affordable to everyone. Um, so we really need to come up with a plan where, um, you know, we're, we're creating more uh, housing subsidies for those who are working. You know, like really think of the strategies in order to get people off of these waiting lists so that we can open up the, the, the housing that is available for others who, who are in need. And when you look at uh, the housing crisis right now, obviously a lot of people are out on waiting lists, as you said, people are getting, how fast are things moving? I mean, do you, do you find that things are moving fast or are they just extremely slow? Well, um, you know, the, uh, there's a lot of frustration with our community because when they come in and they apply, they assume that they'll be called. But what they're doing is applying to be on a lottery. So, you know, each of these developments, they have like, they might have like 15 apartments available for their category of, of income, you know, so 15 apartments available for 20, 30,000 people or more who are applying, you end up being like I've seen people who, you know, we go back and we we check their um, the applications that they've submitted, and some people are like 68,000 on the list, 20,000 on the list. So that means that they'll never be called. Mm -hmm. So this is a lottery, and it means that you know if, if they'll apply for as many as they qualify for, not all that is out. So let's say they had 100 buildings that came up and you only qualify for two, then your options are very skim. Right. You know, you know, uh, the uh, chances are very skim. Right. So if you don't get called, it's just a lottery system. Yeah, it's amazing you know, so. to look at our system mm -hmm. and, and see how many people are actually caught in the balance and so many people that really need services and mm -hmm. don't have a place to go. So one of the things that Nos Quedamos is, is working on, because we are a community development corporation, so we're able to, you know, seek opportunities to build affordable housing. We're actually going to be building something at Hunts Point, but you know that's also going to be something that's going to go through the lottery system as well. But what we're looking is to see how we can work with the city to find uh, available land, find um, some of those HDFCs and some of those those buildings that the city does have that they haven't had the resources to to handle and having organizations like Nos Quedamos take those on, then maybe we can improve the quality of affordable housing and get more people into these. Anna Melendez <laughs> telling us a little bit more about what's going on in Nos Quedamos. Thank you for the great work that thank you guys you. are doing and obviously a me. great need and thank you. And of course, you got to come back and share more information so that we can let our public know as well. Definitely. All righty, Anna Melendez from thank Nos you. Quedamos. Listen, we want you to stay with us. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to have more open coming up right after this. Cheru has no choice. She and millions like her walk miles a day for dirty water. But together, we can end their walk by providing clean water close by. Instead of spending hours walking to get water that makes them sick, girls can be in a classroom and moms will gain back time to care for their families. Sons and daughters can grow up strong, finally free of sicknesses. It's true. When you just add water, you change a life. Learn more at worldvision.org. but I know about investing. Believe in something, buy shares in it, watch it grow. So what if you could invest in the future? The future of kids, like a stock. Not the kind of stock that's about making money, but a stock for social change. A whole new kind of investment called Better Futures. When you invest, it helps kids go to college. I could be one of the first college graduates from my family, the first philanthropist from my neighborhood. And if I'm the first, then maybe there's a second and a third. Believe in us, 
Invest in us. Watch us grow. My name is Sydney, and I'm your dividend. Well, thank you for staying with us. Now, for those young women who are seeking to achieve their career goals or pursue their passion, we're going to tell you about how to empower young professionals right here in the Bronx. Here to tell us a little bit more is Julia Bally. She's the principal at Bronx Career College Preparatory. Sherman Brown, Chief Empowerment Officer at AIM High Empowerment Institute. And Maria Santos, a student at AIM High Empowerment Institute. And we welcome you all to the show. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank having you for us. having us. Good. Sherman, I'll start with you. We, we, we talked about men not too long ago. But yeah. now... Women are front and center. Absolutely. You know, um, for over the years, we've been working um, at the Aim High Empowerment Institute to empower young men. And while we were doing this work, we had great work. We just had our male empowerment event that had over 500 young men um, last month. Um, we went to one school uh, in the South Bronx and met this wonderful principal, Julia Bally. And when we were talking to her about working with her young men in her school, she said, look, I hear in your slogan you say no man left behind. But what about the females? What about the young girls? Mm -hmm. No woman left behind. And she said, I certainly want you guys to come here and work with the students, but we certainly have to get the young girls on board as well. Um, and for the first time ever right there at BCC Prep, um, the AIM High Empowerment Institute is not only working with young men, but also working with young women as well. Ah, so you told them can't forget about the ladies, huh? I told him that's the only way we can do business. <laughs> that's it. All right, all right. It has it, to be the entire community. Well, talk to us about ladies and what do you feel the ladies need? Well, they need the exact same things. A lot of the times, a lot of the resources are definitely, um, they're, the resources that are available mm -hmm. are for our young men. Mm -hmm. And for very, very good reasons. I totally and completely agree. But our females have the exact same deficits. And so I believe in equity across the board. And so one of the things, the conversations we had uh, in April of last year, I said we can definitely do business. And we spent spring break trying to roll out a plan, and they were very diligent in working with a college campus to put an entire program together for our females because they have the exact same challenges in the communities that the men do. But we always consider the females are going to be more resilient. They're going to figure it out. And a lot of the times, that's not the case. That's not how it happens. Mm -hmm. So for Maria, tell me about um, your involvement and how things have been for you. Honestly, AIM High is like such an amazing program because this is definitely, this is a program is, is literally to AIM High. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, it's such a great program because it's empowering us, it's teaching us that, you know, we have that self-confidence and that we can go far in life. And I think it's great because especially being high school students and, you know, even if we're in high school, you know, we have to eventually face reality mm -hmm. and go out into the real world. And I think this is just like a great way to just help us you know, know that, you know, it's fine. You can go into the real world and that, like, you got this. And you can achieve. What is, yeah. what are some, what's the biggest thing that you've learned so far? The biggest thing I've definitely learned is that the only way you can truly succeed is if you believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that self-confidence, if you don't believe you can do it, you're, you're never going to continue on. So talk to us, Sherman, about this. So you guys are working together. Talk about how long the program's been going and, what, and, and some more details. Here. Yeah, so this is actually the first year um, that we're doing it at BCC Prep uh, with the young women. Um, so for the whole year, they've been working with us. They've been going through various workshops. Um, we've been meeting with them on a weekly basis. Um, and these young women also become peer mentors. So Maria is one of those who we are trained and we develop. Um, she's someone who came in from Puerto Rico, right? Her family's from mm -hmm. Puerto Rico. And in her mind, she said, look, I want to play a role in empowering my community and she's helping to empower in the school so for the year we've been working with them and at the end of this year we're gonna look at some of the results um, seeing how much we help to improve in terms of attendance um, how much more confident the young women are um, do the women feel like they're more competent about what to do um, in the high school setting and in the college setting um, and helping them to build their character as well so Julia as a principal what do you find is some of the biggest needs that you see within your school and within the community right now well, I think um, Mr. Brown has covered a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And so competence, confidence, and character is the, is the philosophy um, behind AIM High. And so those are the things, if you can instill that in any young adult, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted that common language across the board. I didn't just want it for the males. I wanted everyone to speak the exact same language with our students. When you can instill those values in students, then they have a chance. They have that ability. They see a future and the possibility that's, that's put forth for them. If they don't have that self-belief, it doesn't matter how many things you put forth for them, they're not going to take the risk. They're not going to take that chance. And so that's what this program has really provided for all of our students. Have you seen the change? Oh, yes, I have. Ah. 
Yes, wow. I have. Yes, I have. I can even tell you just in, um, in our numbers. As a school in the South Bronx, we had a very high incident rate mm -hmm. in terms of the students just having challenges on how to communicate with each other and how to resolve their own issues. And our incident rates are down by 60%. Awesome. Just having wow. this program and training the teachers, so the program also efficiently trains the teachers to be able to provide that support to the students. And so it's like providing that mentorship through a very, very, the, the program, the curriculum, is very well thought out, very well planned, and, and really takes into mind all aspects of the young adult. I want to say, where do you go from here? You just got about a minute left, but where do you go from here? Yeah, well, we have an awesome event coming up next week. Um, we've done the Male Empowerment for years. This year will be the first Female Empowerment um, event. We're going to be doing it um, April 6th um, at 1200 Waters Place on the Mercy College campus. And we're going to have these young women who are going to be there with professionals, um, folks from all walks of life, who are going to help them strive to aim higher and to build the connections and really network. So after the event, these young women will continue, continue growing, continue making things happen. All right, so it's June 6th, not April. You said April. June 6th. So June 6th. Right. I'm sorry. I, I got you. That's yeah. why I got you. Absolutely. Yeah. All the way. All right. Thank you all so much for coming and sharing with us. Thank and you. Congratulations. Keep up the great work. Thank you. All righty. Listen, taking a quick break. We got more open coming up. We'll be back right after this. think getting dumped by text is harsh try getting dumped by tennis ball my ex owner drove me out to the woods yelled fetch and by the time i bought the ball back he was gone yeah i was pissed <laughs> but the folks at the shelter helped me let go of my anger i learned coping skills like taking it to the hole boom now i'm ready to fetch again but how about i throw and you run and get it And thank you for staying with us. The Van Cortlandt Park Flats Mile will be really be special. Well, I should say they will really special this year. They're going to be holding a global running day. And runners on the center path of Van Cortlandt Park will actually join the park's running history and much more. And here now to tell us more is Bobby Asher. He's the vice president at the Van Cortlandt Track Club. And Bobby, good to have you. It's great to be here, Darren. And uh, yeah, so uh, Global Running Day actually is uh, an initiative that was started about uh, five years ago uh, by uh, uh, a contingent of uh, running organizations and basically the the goal is to get as many people uh, fit and active as possible and uh, the Van Cortlandt Track Club that that I'm a part of is uh, is a local track club a local running club community running club that uh, promotes and fosters a welcoming and supportive community for runners of all ability, all levels of ability, experience, and goals in the Bronx and beyond. Mm -hmm. And Global Running Day, uh, really, it all meshes into that. So the Flats Mile really is an event that is going to cater to everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, with a lot of the other uh, guests that you've had on today, uh, there's one common theme that... Uh, that I, I think uh, we can uh, bring into uh, uh, into Global Running Day and any running event, and that's inclusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
really giving everyone a chance to be something that they they may never have thought they could be. And, and running has been and running has been a door opening uh, opportunity for a lot of people. Yes. Talk about what running has done. Running can honestly it, it can it can change lives. It can change the world. Uh, uh, something even even with something small like the Flats Mile, it's a distance that everyone can do. Uh, uh, just at any pace, uh, if you if you're gonna walk it, that's great. You're you're out there. You're 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 giving yourself a chance, and you're giving others a chance because they'll be inspired. Mm -hmm. uh, make no mistake about it. Uh, so uh, just uh, one little uh, initiative here by uh, the head of Bronx Net there. Yes, Mr. Uh, Michael Max Navi. Nah, yes, we have to keep. Yeah, I, yeah, gotta have keep one Bronx set. strong. I run to keep Bronx strong. There it is. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So uh -huh. so. So, so why do you run? You can run to keep Bronx strong. You can, uh, you can make up your own thing. Uh, that's uh, basically we're just giving a chance for everyone to, to do something new and uh, uh, really give themselves a chance. I like the one under there too. You talk about What's the, I run to do what now? Run to get carrot cake. That, <laughs> that's a big one. That's a big one. That's a. Uh, that's what we're giving out as awards for the Flats Mile. Uh, the, uh, the Kids 800, uh, half a mile, mm -hmm. which is actually before the, uh, the adults race, which is the mile, uh, is actually a free event. Uh, that's an official Global Ryan Day event. Uh, New York Roadrunners is uh, helping us uh, promote that and helping us put that on and uh, providing us with materials to to make that the best possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I encourage anyone uh, to, to come out with their kids and uh, whether they're still in the stroller, uh, whether they're just starting to walk, we can take it down from half a mile. We'll, right. uh, we'll make an exception. We just want everyone out there. I want to tell people, if you're coming out there now, come on out June 6th, it's a very important day. You heard Sherman in the last segment talk about June 6th is gonna be a day for them. June 6th is the day for you guys as well. Yes, it is. Yep, so uh, I think that, that, that works out really, uh, really nicely. Uh, uh, I just think uh, it's really important for everyone to just take a chance, not be afraid to take the first step, uh, especially in a beautiful area like Van Cortlandt Park, which is uh, really a gem of New York City, New York State. Uh, we, started, uh, we started the oldest building in the Bronx and finished at a world-famous finish line, and it's a run of history as well as uh, uh, an experience. So, so well, yeah, yeah, everyone should come on out. Well, we encourage people to come on out and listen. You can be a part of it June the 6th, uh, starting at 5 p.m. And uh, it says bid pickup starts at 4. Yes. Okay. So starts at 4, so you get to see the kids do their thing. Uh, and everyone just gets to be a part of it. So expecting a lot of people, hope for many more. Okay. Bobby Asher, Vice President of the Van Cortland Track Club. Thank you so much, Dan. Hey, thank you so much for coming and being with us as well. Listen, take a quick break. We got more open coming up, so stay with us. We'll be right back right after this.
Patriotism. It inspires passionate debate. It's worn like a badge of honor with good reason, because it means love and devotion for one's country. But what really makes up this country of ours? It's the people. To love America is to love all Americans. This year, patriotism shouldn't just be about pride of country. It should be about love, love beyond age, sexuality, disability, race, religion, and other labels. Because love has no labels. And we are back here on Open. A filmmaker originally from the Bronx presents his latest feature titled Butterfly in the Fire. Here now to tell us a little bit more about Butterfly in the Fire is Michael Baez, and we welcome you back home. <laughs> it's great to Good be Good to have you. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, I, I, I actually did one of my trainings here, and, yeah. uh, and, uh, and it's, it's just incredible to be back here, so it's really wonderful. Yeah. And so you start off doing some training with yes. us, right? Yes, and now, you, now, you, now you've blossomed out yeah. to be this filmmaker. You're yeah. bi-coastal. Yeah, yeah. You've got things going on. And you got yeah. this film right now, Butterfly in the Fire. Mm -hmm. Tell us about mm -hmm. it. So it's a, right now it's a short film that we have. And people can watch it on the website. It's butterflyinthefire.com. Uh, but we're raising money to shoot the feature film. Mm -hmm. It's basically a supernatural thriller that we uh, set here in New York. And it's basically a dark love story. You know, we, we've all been in those relationships where we stayed in it for far too long. Uh, we discover that the main character in this particular story has been using, like, black magic to influence his ex-girlfriend right. and also to take out enemies so since it's around the world of Santeria and Brujeria and all that stuff which is common here in the Bronx I just <laughs> drove by a botanic on the way over here yeah 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 it's, it, it's still here it's still here yeah so give us a little bit about what made you decide to do Butterfly in the Fire yes actually um, a lot of different inspirations um, I got the inspiration 20 years ago mm -hmm. and it was from a nightmare I was in I had a dream that the woman who I was in a relationship with uh, was not who she said to be and I woke up from that nightmare and just started writing what was the first scene of the movie and then from there just continue to evolve and evolve and as I discovered the world of Santeria and got into learning about that religion and the culture I decided wow it's such a fascinating world and it, you know Hollywood kind of shows it in a wrong light mm -hmm. so I want to show some truth to it and just show how there is some positivity from it how it is a religion that gives people guidance so that was pretty much the heartbeat of what Before it all stems from and then you know we just started putting the word out there and we put an ad out on backstage uh, in website and got probably 600 and something submissions from light. actors wow. so uh, during the course of um, Christmas and New Year's that little four-day window we actually shot the, 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 the 20 minute version that people can watch online right, right now we're seeing clips of it right now tell oh, us cool. a little bit about what we're seeing right oh, here oh yes yes okay so yeah she was doing the, she's been the, uh, she was sleeping on the train and her ex boyfriend who calls himself Chango uh, did some spells on her and she woke up coughing on the train so it's really showing the parallels of like you know and we leave it open where people think oh is it real is it just you know the imagination is it really happening right no. so, so you did the short now yes. you want to move to the feature yes. so so how you been going about raising funds um just inviting producers inviting people the fortunate thing about living on both coasts is that in LA is a whole different world of you yeah. know Beverly Hills type personalities and then here in, in New York uh, I uh, one thing I've also done is I shot close to 300 TV commercials for small businesses all throughout the Bronx mm -hmm. uh, through Cablevision. Um, now, I've just been you know, talking to different people, inviting them to come see the screen. We did a screening in LA, we did a screening in New York, we had full house, and mm -hmm. uh, had invited some producers and potential investors. So we have some interest, we'll see. You know, God yeah. willing, we'll be shooting it this fall, and then we'll be putting the word out that we're looking for more actors and crew to come aboard. Because we definitely want to shoot it here. You know, I, I wrote it inspired by New York, and I want to shoot it in the Bronx and just showcase, you know. Were you surprised when the 600 people responded? Yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting that many. Yeah. <laughs> but it just showed me that, you know, people are looking for work. You know, there are actors out there and this was on both coasts we, we put the word out on both coasts and to see the people de definitely wanted to work and they knew there was gonna be a lot of money or independent mm -hmm. uh, but they were willing to throw in the hat and we had a great cast by the way uh, Janisha Rios and Sebastian would play the two leads in the current short film mm -hmm. uh, as well as another gentleman by the name of Lauren Samuels and, uh, and uh, Angie Castro and even my son makes a little appearance Is that right? <laughs> yeah Get if, out. I, if a five-year-old boy he, he has a little scene in the, in, in the film well, yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. turn him out to be a star early yeah we're gonna he's a good-looking kid that's it well <laughs> listen so if people want watch the film they can watch the short yes, now yes. On, online yeah online it's butterflyinthefire.com and not only is there's that short on there but a bunch of other shorts that I've done that have won awards a racket uh, sweet tube saved by the pole all films that we shot here in New York they're also on there as well my very first short film called consequences which actually came on this show I think it was this show or another show mm -hmm. years ago and talked about so they can watch that on there as well well it's great to have you back thank you and great continue to be here. the great work Michael Bias, filmmaker, got to start right here, y'all. Yeah, and we're grateful yeah. for what you're doing, yeah. and keep up the good stuff. Awesome, thank you. All right, listen, taking a quick break. We're going to be back with more Open. Stay with us. We'll come right back right after this. So, I'm kind of new here.
but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. 150 over 90. 180 over 111. 160 over 110. I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure looks like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from invisible or silent. If you've come off your treatment plan, get back on it. Or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. Well, fashion for all sizes, ethnicities, and styles. Yes, we welcome you back to the show. And also coming back to the show is guess who? Bronx fashion designer Edwin Reyes. Welcome back. Thank you. Exciting time for you, huh? Yeah. Previews. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about this here. Yeah, so um, I'm having a summer collection June 11th at the Monhaven Bar and Grill. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be showing um, different trends for summer 2018 for women. And the trends is more like 1980s, you know, like freestyle and um, that era, you know. Right. And so today I brought a, a, li a little piece of a preview of the collection. So, uh, so we're going to see this collection in just a few minutes or we're going to go to the model in just a few seconds. But, mm -hmm. but talk to us about the trends. What kind of trends are we seeing right now? Um, so for summer, it's more like greens, more yellows, bright colors, um, reds, um, off-whites, not super white off-white, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, it's more like oversized pieces with fitted pants and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing our model right now. Tell us what we're seeing. So, so we have um, one of the, it's a two-piece um, piece. It's a, more of like an olive green undertone. And she matched it with these gold heels. And yeah, it's more yeah, she's like, wearing like a shoes. 1980s vibe going on. <laughs> So the 80s vibe is going on. So, yeah. so it's going to take place at the uh, Mod Haven Bar and Grill. Yes. And so people can come on out and be a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so talk to us about getting this, uh, you know, summer collection out and really putting your thing out there for the summer. What's the process been like for you? Um, it's been very stressful because it's prom <laughs> season too. So, you know, you got that and then this. Yeah. So it's a lot of sewing late nights. Mm -hmm. and, and so between prom season and this, you got to yeah. do both. You got you have to do both. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So as this as they're looking at this model here, talk about how many models you're gonna have, what's gonna be happening, what people can expect. Gotcha. So I'm gonna have between like six to eight models, you know, depending who's available, and um, you everyone can find the information on my website www.findbyadmireyes or my Instagram findbyadmireyes as well. Um, there's no fee to come in, but it's a donation at, at the door for mm -hmm. the brand for future events and shows and whatnot. So. Yeah. What do you want people to take away from your work? Um, that there's always a piece for every, everybody. Mm -hmm. So there's a piece for a smaller, a smaller girl, a bigger girl, medium-sized girl, you know, mm -hmm. the whole range. Even a person of color, somebody who's super dark, somebody who's super light, there's always a piece for that person. So that's why I, I want to portray it. And what inspires you? Who inspires you? Um, honestly, God inspires me to continue this work and I use fashion as a tool to help women feel beautiful and to help, help them feel empowered. That's awesome. And so if people want to find out more, listen, it's going to be at the Mod Haven Bar and Grill on June the 11th. What time does it start there? Doors open at 545. Okay, doors open at 545. I want to make sure that you get a chance to come on out and see uh, anything that we should be looking for in the summer as far as, uh, you know, if we're out there taking a look at fashion, what can we expect? Um, just expect a whole bunch of nice clothing and just a good vibe. All right, good all right. Vibe. Well, Edwin, thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. Listen, uh, he's thank got you. a brand that focuses on women empowerment and Focusing on women of color, thank you to our model for coming and sharing a little bit. Got the olive green on and got the <laughs> shoes that are popping. Thanks a lot, Edwin. <laughs>
Thank you. All righty, listen. Well, everybody, we have come to the end of our show today. I want to thank our guests for joining us. And most of all, I want to thank now you, the viewer, for tuning in. Now, if you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the ReCableCast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Cablevision's Channel 67. If you have Verizon Files, you can join us on Channel 33 or watch anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. For all of us here on the set of Open, I'm Darren Jaime saying take care, God bless, and most of all, keep this channel wide open. Thank you. Thank you. You did well. The last, the last day of Bronx Week 2018 ended with a parade of marching bands, community organizations, schools, and civic groups marching along Marshall Loop Parkway to highlight the best of the borough and to celebrate its 46th anniversary. We're here in the Bronx having a wonderful time concluding Bronx Week 2018. To everyone, it's been a wonderful week tonight. Today we're out here, 80 degrees, the sun is shining on us, the Lord is shining on us. We got bands, we got businesses, we got children. We just got the Bronx community coming out, showing their love, being a part of something that's greater than us and that's unifying us. I always say people pay attention to people who participate, but they're participating and they're paying attention to the Bronx today because we are shining like if they don't know, Bronx strong. <laughs> Out of the many sponsorships, United Healthcare was one of the biggest donors to participate. We're here to celebrate the Bronx and to support all the things that the borough president's office is doing. United has been working to try to get the uninsured population lowered here in the Bronx and to make sure that we don't continue to be 62 any longer out of all the counties. So we're here to just promote health and health access and, um, you know, get people insured. Out of the many dance groups that participated in the parade, we spoke to Queen of Little Branches of Boringuen. Today, yeah, today we're doing baton swirling and cheerleading with the music and we just, the girls love it. The girls, is, they smile while doing it, they enjoy it, brings happiness to the older ones. We do it for their happiness as well so whatever the little ones love to do we follow their dreams help them we also spoke to young male adults about the programs they currently participate in here's what they said the mission of AFJRTC in general every unit is um, to develop services of character dedicated to serving the nation and community with patriotism we uh, take students that are especially high school students and mold them into being better citizens and um, Show them like there's other things that sports and whatnot to be a part of in high school. As you see, we have a band here. We march. We have a military truck. You know, just promoting ourselves, putting our stuff out there, trying to recruit. I'm Yesenia Ramos, reporting from the Bronx for BronxNet. What?